Today on Blue 58, the question at quarterback is the same for the Packers this year as it's been for the last few. Can Aaron Rodgers get them to the Super Bowl? And will we see some of the promise that made Jordan Love a first-round pick in 2020? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink, happy to be with you here for another episode. It is time for our position-by-position previews for the 2022 Packers season to begin. We'll be mixing in book club stuff as we go along, but it's time to dive in. And I think we're going to do things a little bit differently this year, going to structure things a little bit better. Every position group is going to have an overall discussion. We'll talk about the position as a whole, but I want to go through every single person on the roster at every single position. And we're going to set expectations for those players. That is something that we've done in the past. We're going to do it slightly differently this year. First, the standard. High expectations, medium expectations, low expectations, but we're adding in a category for people who are just very low end of the roster type guys. We're going to say no expectations for those. And, you know, within that overall context, expectations can mean different things for different people. For instance, high expectations for Aaron Rodgers are different than high expectations for Jordan Love. I think you understand kind of intuitively my, why that might be. It's not a perfect definition, admittedly, but I think it helps us categorize some players. We also want to define, and this is something that I admittedly have not done well in the past, what a player has to do to meet those expectations. So we'll talk about this in a couple minutes, but Aaron Rodgers facing pretty high expectations this year. What does he have to do to meet those expectations? Sounds pretty good. Good. I also want to make some predictions about every player on the roster too, or at least almost every player. Some guys, it's just going to be impossible to to say what they're they're going to do this year or it it honestly just doesn't matter what they do for some of them as well. But overall, we're going to try to have more than 100 predictions this year because it seems like a big, fun number. Sound good? Good. Let's get started with our discussion about quarterbacks. Packers quarterbacks this year are basically the same in the same spot that they've been since 2020, more or less. You've got Aaron Rodgers, you've got Jordan Love, and you've got a third guy. And there's only a third guy right now because the Packers released Kurt Bankert last week. More broadly speaking, the Packers quarterbacks are basically in the same spot as they've been since about 2015. Since then, whether it's been Jordan Love or somebody else, they've had Aaron Rodgers and a developmental prospect and then just a guy sticking around. Back in the day, it was Brett Hundley. Then it was Deshaun Kaiser. Now it's Jordan Love. And thinking about the Packers quarterbacks as a whole, I wonder if that's the right way to go about things. We'll never know the answer to this, of course, but I wonder how much differently a few situations would have played out over the past couple of years if the Packers had gone with a model a bit more like what the Packers did in the Wolf and Sherman era. Then you had Brett Favre and Doug Peterson, pretty much for the duration. You had Brett Favre, obviously, but you had in Peterson a solid veteran backup. And maybe more importantly, or at least just as importantly, a guy who was Brett Favre's friend. Call him Brett Favre's caddy, basically. For most of the past decade, though, the Packers have really invested in the developmental quarterback model, and it really hasn't borne any fruit. They traded up for Brett Hundley on day three in 2015, and that really never came to anything. Day three quarterbacks are a stretch anyway, but it was a a swing and a miss. They traded for Deshaun Kaiser, who never really became anything either. In the process, they got rid of a toxic asset in Demarius Randall, but Kaiser, despite his physical gifts, did not develop into anything. Then in 2020, of course, they traded up for Jordan Love, and the jury is admittedly still out, but I think it's fair to say so far no good. Now we talked about learning the wrong lessons a few episodes back. And that I don't think really applies here. Because I think the question you're asking about quarterbacks is what if the whole idea is wrong to begin with? And I don't have a definitive answer here. I just think it's worth thinking about. The Packers have sunk a lot of resources and time, maybe just as importantly, maybe more importantly, into developing backup quarterbacks. It really hasn't worked. They're now on version 3.0 of that process, and we'll see how things go with Jordan Love, but so far, the results have not been good. 
And looking at the the broader landscape of quarterbacks in the NFL, I think there's reason to think that the day of the days really of developing a guy from backup to starter, or at least backup to asset, might be over. The 2011 CBA really changed how quarterbacks can practice and spend time in the off season. And I think since then, you've basically seen guys come into the league as pretty much the player they're going to be. Sure, there is some improvement and there are some exceptions. Josh Allen, a notable one. He's gotten significantly better over the life of his NFL career. Patrick Mahomes, too. I, I, I think he would have become some version of the player that he is, but maybe not as quickly had he not sat for a little bit. A little bit. But I think, by and large, guys are coming into the league ready to play. And just as, if not more importantly, they're coming into the league without very many opportunities to develop. The Packers, though, are still trying to develop quarterbacks. And so far, it hasn't really worked in the the Gutekunst era and the late Thompson era. That brings us to Jordan Love and the rest of the quarterbacks. But we'll get to that in a second. First, I want to give some Patreon shout-outs to Darren Dohler, Zach Thundy, and Glenn Miller. Each of them have supported the Power Sweep and Blue 58 since 2021. Thank you for your support. And if you would like to become a supporter as well, I would like to direct you to the Power Sweep, uh, patreon.com slash the Power Sweep, if you'll excuse me, uh, where you can become a Patreon supporter for any dollar amount you like per month or annually. Uh, in doing so, you will get access to some bonus content and our awesome Discord server, which is where you can hang out with Packers fans from all over the world and talk about football and a whole bunch of other stuff to your heart's content. So consider hitting us up at patreon.com slash the Power Sweep and you'll Get in the club there, too. All right, this year's quarterbacks. We're down to three as the Packers are sitting with their roster at 89 right now. Makes you wonder what's going to go on there. But in the meantime, all we've got is Danny Etling, Jordan Love, and Aaron Rodgers. Etling, going with expectations low to high, comes to the Packers as a pretty good athlete, and that's basically been it to this point in his career. He's already been switched around between a couple of different positions, already spent some time at wide receiver, but he's back at quarterback in Green Bay for the Packers. And to be fair, he is a very good athlete, a very thickly built athlete for the height that he is. Back at the combine, he measured in at six foot two and 230 pounds, so pretty pretty well built for his height. He is a guy that I would slot into the no expectations camp. He looks to me like a camp arm and maybe a practice squad and virtually nothing else. I think overall, if you look at what the Packers are going to do at quarterback this year, they're probably going to be looking for a more quarterback-esque quarterback when they want to find a camp arm. I'm not sure Etling is necessarily going to be the answer for the Packers' number three quarterback job, especially considering that they moved on from Kurt Bankert, who's got a couple years in the system and seems to be a more polished prospect than Etling is. So there's really nothing Etling can do to meet expectations because he really, there are none for him. And my prediction related to Etling is that he will not be the Packers practice squad quarterback this year, that they're going to bring in somebody else between now and either the start of training camp or the regular season. Etling is going to be elsewhere for this year. Now, Jordan Love, Currently the Packers' number two quarterback. I expect that he basically has that job locked up for this season and for, well, for as long as Aaron Rodgers sticks around in Green Bay. You know the story so far on Jordan Love. In 2020, the Packers passed up on wide receivers that they would have considered a reach late in the first round and traded up to select Jordan Love. There's been some fallout related to that, much of it tied to Aaron Rodgers. Generally, I think you could describe Jordan Love's play when he has been on the field as unexciting. Some of that his fault. Some of it is not his fault. But again, we're belaboring the point a little bit here. You know the story so far. What about 2022 for Jordan Love? My expectations for Love this year are pretty high. I would consider year three to be put up or shut up time. It's time. Even if you count 2020 as essentially a lost year due to the the pandemic, due to not being able to be on the field and OTAs and minicamp and so on and so forth, doing all that virtually. He's got to be getting close to what I think you could consider a, a critical mass of practice reps. He's just had so much time in practice. How many excuses can you really give him in terms of, you know, playing time opportunities? Admittedly, the game situations have not been ideal. He's hardly gotten onto the field under under great circumstances. 
just as a recap, 2021 preseason, he was a bit banged up. Didn't go onto the field healthy. The Chiefs game. Uh, we've talked again and again and again this past season about the, the flawed game plan that Matt LaFleur put out there for him. And then, of course, Week 18, things did not go well when he was out there against the Lions, but he hardly had a great supporting cast at that point either. The offensive line was deep depth guys at that point. Skill position players were not the, the top liners. It's understandable if his, his performance was a little bit subpar. I don't think that exonerates him fully, but you, you at least have some what, plausible deniability there? We could say that. He also, for that matter, took all of the reps last offseason and most of them this offseason. I think it's fair to start asking him to look a little bit like a real NFL player. <laughs> and really, it's time for him to start looking like something one way or another. I would rather have him go out there and just look like an absolute dumpster fire because then you can move on. I'm not really holding out any hope for the Packers trading him for anything substantive at this point, and I don't think you really should either. But at least if he goes out there and stinks up the joint, you can say, all right, Jordan Love is not going to be it. We can move on. Whether that's trading him for a a day three pick or something, who knows? But he's got to look like something, either look good or look really bad. Middling stuff is, is just puts him and the Packers in a bad spot. So how can Jordan Love meet these expectations? He's got to have a solid preseason, and I don't really have a firm definition of what solid means per se, but it could look something like dominating his competition. He's not going to be going against the studs out there for the opposing defenses, at least not all of them. He's probably not going to have the full supporting cast either, though I would expect at some point in the preseason he'll go out there as the de facto starting quarterback with what amounts to the rest of the number one offense. What I would ask of Jordan Love is really just look like a varsity guy playing JV. Not to draw too much from my increasingly distantly removed um, high school playing career, but I can remember what it was like as a a sophomore in high school splitting time between playing, playing games on varsity in basketball and playing games on JV. The varsity game at first was overwhelming. You get in there and it's just so, so fast, but you start to get used to the pace of play. Um, You settle in, you you realize you've got the skills to be there, so on and so forth. But then you drop down to JV again, and it's like everybody's playing in slow motion. You'll run the same play that you ran well with the varsity guys on JV, and things just don't happen like quite as crisply as it does on the JV JV level. And that's not throwing your own teammates under the bus. That has partly to do with the defense or whatever. It just wasn't as crisp. What you would like to see is Jordan Love kind of dominating his competition that same way. He's been with the number one guys. He's he's faced off against NFL defenses before. Now you get in there in the preseason, you're not playing a full NFL defense. Look like you are a man among boys out there. Show us that arm talent. Show command of the offense. Prediction-wise, maybe it's just today. Maybe you catch me at a different time next week, whenever. But I'm feeling bullish on Jordan Love right now. I think that he will look good in the preseason. And I think part of that is going to be having wide receivers that are kind of on the same developmental level as he is. Previously, I think he was hurt by having to play with Rodgers guys. You know, Devontae Adams, Marquez Valdez-Cantling, Equinemia St. Brown. Those guys all had the offense fine-tuned to work with Aaron Rodgers. And we know that the Aaron Rodgers offense is different than the Jordan Love offense, just by virtue of how long Love has been playing and how long Rodgers has been playing. Things are more finely tuned when Rodgers is out there. It's just a fact. But this year, you've got guys like Christian Watson, Romeo Dubs, even Sammy Watkins, Samori Torre, guys that Love is coming up along with, who are actually behind the developmental curve to where Jordan Love is. Maybe he can perform a little bit better with those guys who are running the offense tailored to Jordan Love instead of running the offense tailored exclusively to Aaron Rodgers. A theory, but I think one with a little bit of merit. I think he is going to look good in the preseason. If he doesn't, all right, then we can have a different conversation. What about the big man himself, Aaron Rodgers? One of the interesting things about this entire era of the power sweep is more or less the time in which we have covered the Packers. Dating back to 2016, we've talked about Aaron Rodgers being in legacy mode. 
really everything Rodgers needed to accomplish as a player had already happened by the time we started the powersweep.com and Blue 58 and everything that went with it. But since then, he's gone on the run the table run. He came back from his shoulder or his collarbone injury in 2017. He looked bad, but um, he, he came back from that and then was back in, in 2018 for the last year of the McCarthy era, settled in with Lafleur, and now won two MVPs. He's got nothing to prove. He's a really good player, obviously. On the one hand, then, setting expectations for Rodgers is kind of, kind of pointless. What can you really expect from him? But on the other hand, yes, obviously he is facing pretty incredibly high expectations, but he's played at a high level the last two years. And the Packers are paying him accordingly, so it's totally fair to expect the world from him. Looking at that question again, then, what does legacy mode even mean for Rodgers? I kind of think he's competing against himself at this point. The greatest of all time debate is dumb, of course. Um, I've gone on and on and on and on about that. But the plain fact is nobody's ever going to seriously put him ahead of Brady because the rings carry too much weight, rightly or wrongly. I think it's wrong. We don't have to unpack all that. I think it's it's a settled thing among the national media who are willing to say things like, okay, Tom Brady is going to go against the baby goat in Patrick Mahomes. So we've got two greatest of all times playing at the same time. doesn't make any sense. You see the problem. But looking at Roger's legacy, what could that legacy mean? Well, for starters, another Super Bowl win would put him, I think, inarguably ahead of Brett Favre in Packers lore, which is not inconsiderable considering the way that Aaron Rodgers came in to Green Bay and started his Packers career. People are still going to argue about that forever because that's what people do, but I think it would put him ahead of Brett Favre if you're into ranking things. He's also got the possibility of setting every Packers record in the, the every Packers passing record, that is. He's already got the, the passing touchdowns one. Another two years would put him over the top on completions and yards, just for sure. Finally, I think the third part of his legacy is going out on his own terms. That's really been the deal the past couple of years with Rodgers, is he's upset about, or has seemed to be upset about the um, uh, the perception that the Packers might move on, move on from him before he's ready to move on from football. Now, it's a pretty short list of guys that get to decide to go out on their own term. You want to circle back to Tom Brady, Even he didn't get to go out in New England on his own terms. If you believe the story about him trying to engineer his way to Miami this past offseason, look that one up if you haven't. He still hasn't been able to go out on his own terms. Not even in Tampa. But Rodgers, I think part of his own legacy is going to be going out that way. And I think that's really it. Another ring, setting some passing records, and defining his own ending. That's legacy mode for Rodgers. What about this year? Expectations are obviously pretty high. He's still playing at a high level, or was last year and was in 2020. The Packers need him to play at a high level, so I don't think it's asking all that much for him to to meet those expectations. So how can he meet them? Three ways. First, play MVP caliber football. I don't mean win MVP again, but his contract was for future performance, not past performance. So he's getting paid like an MVP We need him to play like an MVP. Secondly, we want him to integrate well with the new Packers wide receiving core. I'm kind of tired of the rookie wide receivers don't play well with Aaron Rodgers storyline because I don't think it's true. How many, first, how many rookies of note has he actually played with? I think there's really three, maybe five, depending how you count. You've got Randall Cobb in 2011. I mean, you want to ding him for not putting up big stats as a rookie? How is he going to do that, playing behind Greg Jennings, Jordy Nelson, James Jones, Jermichael Finley, and Donald Driver? He's what, the sixth option? I don't really know what you're looking for there. Devontae Adams in 2014. Well, he did pretty well as the third option behind Jordy Nelson and Randall Cobb, who both had monster seasons that year. Devontae Adams had 38 catches for 446 yards and three touchdowns. That's pretty good. Ty Montgomery in 2015, 15 catches, 136 yards, two touchdowns in six games. Again, pretty good, and he was not going to be the top option that year either. Expanding it out to some day three picks in 2018, Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Equinemius St. Brown, MBS, 38 catches, 581 yards, three touchdowns. EQ, 21 catches, 328 yards in 12 games. Seems pretty good for rookie wide receivers. You've got Amari Rodgers last year. Okay, that didn't go well. 
but he was not among the Packers' top options, and there were some other considerations there too. So let's get rid of that entire Aaron Rodgers doesn't play well with rookie wide receivers storyline and still talk about him integrating well with the new Packers wide receiver group. Rodgers does need to do what he, whatever he can do to make this whole new group successful. You've got a bunch of new faces there. Again, Sammy Watkins, Christian Watson, Romeo Dubs, um, Samori Torre. The list goes on. Even throw in Amari Rodgers in there too. He's going to be a part of this offense in a different way than he was last year. This is not really a hard and fast sort of expectation, but it's kind of a know it when you see it sort of thing. It's very important that he and the Packers wide receivers are on the same page and they got to be on the same page pretty quickly. I think he can do it, but it's part of the expectations for him this year. Finally, another squishy one, but how about this? Don't be the reason the Packers get bounced out of the playoffs. I think there's a perception, fair or not, and I've done more than my share, fair share of defending Aaron Rodgers on this podcast for his postseason performance the last couple of years. But there is a perception out there that he is the reason they've been eliminated. You can put that storyline to bed this year. Have a have one of those postseason performances where he plays well, and if they lose, blame it on the defense, blame it on something else. All right? At least make that storyline go away for one offseason. That's how he can meet those expectations this year. Predictions for Rodgers, how about five of them? I think he's going to go for 35 or more touchdown passes again. That would be a big achievement with his wide receiver group. And just career-wise, it would be the first time in his career that he's done that three seasons in a row. It seems kind of like a weirdly low bar, but 35 or more touchdowns in three straight seasons is a lot. Peyton Manning only did it once. Tom Brady's never done it. Drew Brees only did it once. And Brett Favre only did it once. Only one three-year span where uh, those guys hit 35 touchdowns or more. I think uh, Rodgers is going to throw for more than 4,200 yards, but less than 4,500, about a 300-yard range there. I also think he's going to play 16 games at least. That would be five seasons in a row of that. I think he's going to make the Pro Bowl this year or whatever they call it now that the game is is going to be going away. And I think he's going to get an MVP vote, at least one, but will not win the MVP this year. So those are your quarterbacks for the 2022 Green Bay Packers. Agree with the, the predictions? Overall discussion? Disagree? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Hit us up at thepowersweep1959 at gmail.com if you want to weigh in. Or find us on social media. Weigh in wherever you like. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. In the meantime, that's all I've got for you in this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate it. If you would share it with someone you think would enjoy it as well, that's the number one way we grow. And uh, your word of mouth really does a lot for the show. Really, really appreciate that kind of effort on your behalf. It, it really does help us a lot. And, of course, it's going to get more people involved in the conversation that you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.